to uh, Philadelphia not too long ago. First time, it was great. Enjoyed it. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about Benjamin Franklin lately. He said a few things that's applicable to my subject today. One, he says there the only two things certain in life is death and taxes. And the other thing he said that's applicable to what I'm talking about today is if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so my subject today is is mostly just to get your mind on what's going to happen about something you don't want to think about. And what I do, uh, I will tell you, I do estate planning. Now I've had people in my office uh, who had to leave and come back because they could not deal with what I was trying to talk to them about. They don't want to think about death. They don't want to think about um, being incapacitated. And so uh, I've actually had people get up and leave and we had to reschedule so they could think about these things because it was emotionally draining for them. So I'm going to force you to think about what's going to happen to your business if something happens to you. Because I know most of the people in this room, um, you are a key person. If you're in this room, you're probably a key person in your business. And so you have to think about these things. So you need to go through the, the questions of what's going to happen if something happens to me. Who's going to run the business? What's, does the business have to be shut down? If it has to be shut down, what's going to happen to the assets? What's going to happen to my employees? Those are all questions you're going to have to force yourself to address. Now, when I advise my clients, I always start out with, okay, let's start out with just looking. You have a will or a trust. Let's start with the basics. If you have any kind of estate planning at all, you will be very much amazed how many people don't have even a simple will. And I'm talking about accomplished business owners that just don't either don't take the time or don't want to deal with it and they just don't address it. So I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you if you have anything at all. Just think to yourself, do I have anything in place if something happens to me? Now traditionally, let's let's there's two things you need to worry about. One is becoming incapacitated, the other one is dying. Um, those are two different things and two different tools address different uh, of those uh, of those two um, eventualities. The traditional way of transferring assets is a will. Now a will only, only takes place, only goes into effect when you die. A will does not go into effect when you're incapacitated. That's something a lot of people don't understand. So you need to keep that in your mind. When you become incapacitated, when you can't make decisions, then you're not going to be able to use the will to tell people what you want to have happen. It may be evidence in the court case, but it will not be dispositive. So traditionally is a will. Will goes into effect when you die. A will, and it's another thing a lot of people don't understand, every will gets probated to some extent. Every will, to make it be effective, has to go to the court. Because in your will, you like designate somebody to make decisions on behalf of your estate. The estate is what you leave behind when you die. And the court has to appoint somebody and give them authority do what they need to do on your behalf. Let's say that you have a building. You're a business owner, you have a building. Or you have your home. There's nobody authorized when you die to transfer title to that home. That's why you have to go to court. Now there's some things we can do to avoid that. Um, that is called probate avoidance, and that's one of the major goals of a state plan. But traditionally wills were didn't go effect until you died. They were public. And I will tell you that there are unscrupulous people who go to the court records and look and see who just died and who just got money. So that was a major drawback for wills. Uh, another thing is wills usually don't uh, take into consideration much uh, tax planning. There's just not much tax planning behind a will. So some really smart lawyers got together and said, you know, the wills have got some, really, some real problems with them. Let's create something so that we can avoid those downsides to a will. And what they came up with were, were what's known as living trusts. Trusts are old, but not as old as wills. And living trusts, or revocable trusts, revocable living trusts, were created so that you could, uh, so that you could over, overcome some of these downsides to a will. For instance, under the terms of a trust, you can transfer, you can transfer um, powers to your successor trustee if you're incapacitated, you can resign as trustee. You can you can assign somebody else to take over for you, and you can also have a provision that automatically gives your successor trustee the ability to act in your behalf, even without 
um, it's not a court ordering that. So that took care of that, that issue with incapacity versus death. Um, another thing that the trust is, the trust is not probated. The trust does not go to court. The trust is like a business, and the business doesn't die. The business doesn't die, and a trust doesn't die. And so if something happens to you, the trust keeps going on as if some new manager came in to take over. The successor trustee is like a new manager that comes in and takes over the trust. Uh, and so you can avoid probate. There are two major goals that go into estate planning for people who have assets. One is asset protection, and the other one is probate avoidance. Now, trusts and incorporations both go in to addressing those two goals. Uh, it is beyond the scope of this short presentation to go into all the reasons how that uh, how that all happens. But just know I'm going to limit myself to wills and trusts, and know that there there's an availability that you can make provisions for somebody to come in and take over your business if you need to. Okay. Now, this is particularly important if you have partners. Let me tell you a very common thing that happens. You've got two partners. One of them dies. What happens to that person's interest? The person who dies. Yeah, it's going to get probated, and eventually it's going to be divested to his heirs. And that could be children, it could be the wife, and it could be any number of other people that the surviving partner does not want to do business with. <laughs> Okay, you have to understand, you went into business with this person, but if this person's gone, who comes in and takes his interest can be something you do not want to do business with. So that's why we have what we call buy-sell agreements. Buy-sell agreements are, can, be, can be independent documents. They can also be placed within your operating agreement or your bylaws that, by the way, every business should have. A little plug for Damien over there. <laughs> Everybody needs to have those documents, and your buy-sell agreement can be in there. Now the buy sell agreement tells everyone what's hap what happens to my interest if I die. And what you can do as partners, when you go into partnership with somebody, you can say, okay, if either one of us dies or becomes incapacitated, this is what's going to happen. I get first, they can have a right of first refusal. I get right of first refusal, which means you can't sell your business to anybody. You have to offer it to me first. Now that can take place when somebody becomes incapacitated or dies or even if they just want to sell, that right of, first, uh, uh, right of first refusal can be put in. Another thing that can be put in is what we call um, an automatic buyout, okay? It could be that if something happens to your partner, there's a provision where you automatically buy his interest so that his heirs don't get it, okay? And it's just like last man standing wins, kind of one of those provisions. And I usually get the question, well, what if I don't have the money to buy him out? Because you're going to have to value his interest and pay his estate the value of the interest that you're buying. And many people say, well, how am I, what if I don't have the money to do that? And my advice on that is there is key man insurance, what's called key man insurance. What happens is your business takes out insurance policy, or you. You take an insurance policy on your partner, he takes an insurance policy on yours. I won't get into the details because I'm not an insurance guy, but basically key man insurance pays the surviving partner a, 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 a buyout, a, excuse me, a certain amount on the life insurance, and that surviving partner uses that life insurance to buy his old partner's interest. It gives them the cash necessary to, uh, to be able to buy them out. So you don't have this problem of the family coming in and now you're doing business with, with the wife you can't stand. I have a question. Peter, yes. the insurance policy? Does the corporation have insurance? Yeah, that's when I said I'm not gonna get into it because I'm not an insurance guy. Uh, and basically, it, they, if you say key man insurance, the insurance person is going to know what it is. And you can do it, I think you can do it either way. There, I will caution you, um, I'm not, also not a tax person. So I don't give tax, I, I don't know, I don't give tax advice, but I know enough to warn people when I know there's a tax issue. So when you're going to get that insurance, you need to look at what's the tax consequences going to come from you gaining that, that money. Um, who's going to gain the money? What's the tax consequences going to be? And so you'll put that into your plan. And a good insurance person will be able to address all of those concerns. Um, so I try not to get into areas that I don't feel really comfortable about. And taxes is one of them. <laughs> all right. 
Um, another problem I see oftentimes when something happens to somebody is who owns something. If you take your computer from home that you got for Christmas and you take it to work and you put all kinds of work related stuff on it, private, corporate, property stuff, software onto your private computer, that can be a real problem. Because who gets the computer in the end? And who gets what's on the computer? Who owns those things? Another example, you're doing business and you're writing a program. Let's say you're writing a, a software program. Do you who created the software program own that program? Or does your employer who's paying you own that program? Those are issues if they are not addressed can cause some major uh, problems, especially if that software becomes a million dollar asset. There's going to be you know, significant. Isn't there common law on this stuff? Yes, there is. You don't want to go to common law. <laughs> yeah, here's, here's what it is. Let me tell you about common law. You brought it. Here's what common law is. Common law is what you get when you got nothing else. And what I mean is there's statutory law and common law. Statutory law is when the legislature came together and says, this is what you're going to do. Oh, by the way, there's one up there's the third one. Let me go back before that. There is contractual law. You can contract that this is what's going to happen and this is what does. If you don't have a contract, then you may have to go to statutory law. That's law passed by um, legislatures. And then if you don't have a contract and you don't have a statute, what you're left with is common law. Common law is what comes after that, which is you know, what does this what does the legislature say, what have the court said, and so it's kind of like a catch-all. You don't want common law, and you don't even want statutory law if you can avoid it. There's many statutes that you can actually contract around, some you cannot. Okay? That's not my subject, so I shouldn't get off on a tangent. Uh, but it's important to know. There are some things you can contract to that are contrary to the statutory law, but the statutory law allows for. They allow you to be more stringent than their law, or it, the statute itself will say so. The statute will also say um, when you can't do it. If you try to if you try to contract something away that's against public policy, it will be invalidated uh, by the by the statutory laws. So, so if you have a revocable trust, then you don't have to worry about these issues. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes and no. As a good lawyer. <laughs> It's never just yes. as a good lawyer. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that's, that's always our answer. Um, Great. Great. Um, it, it, it depends. You cannot have a contract that says we're going to involve ourselves in legal legal activities and this is what we're going to do because it, it's just going to be invalidated. The whole thing's going to be invalidated. But if the law gives you a little bit of leeway, then you want to take the leeway and create what you want within your within your contracts. If, if the law allows you this kind of leeway, you want to take your contract and make sure you take this option and make it this, because this is what you want. You don't want these options. This is what we agreed to. This is what we want. And so long as it's allowable under the law, the law will enforce it, OK? The law will not enforce something that's contrary to public policy and contrary to law, basically, OK? Um, Business succession plan. A business succession plan is, is just a general term for all of this stuff. It's you sitting down and saying, what's going to happen? You have to use your imagination and say, something happens to me, I get in a car accident tomorrow. Immediately, what's going to happen? Who's going to take care of my clients? Who's going to take care? Who's going to get access to the bank accounts? Who's going to do the invoicing? Who's going to get the business? Those are something you have to sit down and you have to do. You have to take that opportunity and force yourself, if necessary, to think through those questions. Now, a little plug for me, I can help you think of questions you're not thinking of. A good lawyer will take you through that list and have you think of things that you don't think of because you haven't dealt with the garbage that I am that's up on my desk. Um, I've had a lot of people not address this, and I have to clean up the mess afterwards. So I can tell you, this is what you need to look at, this is what you need to look at, this is what you need to look at. And uh, it can be a pretty significant uh, a list. I won't go here now, here now because it's pretty much dependent on your type of business. 
and the way you operate your business. Okay? Any questions? Yeah, I love to call. Sorry. Um, I'm trying to think, like, with our, with our LLC, she and I are the managers. Um, there's no employees or anything like that. And, but quite often we travel together, and if something unfortunate should happen to both of us at the same time, what kind of mechanism um, is available for us that was not passed on the business or the firm that are very minimal in assets? You know, one of the most fascinating things I ever studied in class is what happens if who died first in a, in a plane crash? Because if it's, there's actual cases on, well, they, this person lived 20 minutes more than this one, therefore they inherited from the person who died, and it's, it's some real issues. And there's some laws that, that address that. Uh, most good wills or trusts will address that. Um, but there's a lot of issues when more than one person is involved in an accident. Uh, who dies first? By how long? Uh, by how short? Um, a good estate plan will say where it goes if both of you go. And most of it will say whoever dies first, it goes to the survivor, and then the survivor to the children. But a good, a good trust will say um, if the spouse does not survive by however long, then it is as if they predeceased. And I don't want to get into all that. Um, if, if you come to me, I'll talk to you more specifically because I don't have time. But there are provisions that take part that, that go into effect so that what you want to have happen actually happens. I think that's the short answer. That's my maybe kind of answer. A lot of people here are solo creditors. They don't have partners. They don't have employees, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering where do they fit into this the estate planning? Why would they need a, a revocable trust? Yeah. Okay. Uh, revocable trusts are actually for individuals. I only bring them up for business because it's a business for people. But estate planning is for individuals. Uh, it's for single individuals, people without children. It just depends on the level of it that you need. If you have children, you need a state plan. You've got to name somebody to take care of those children if something happens to you. That's, a, that's not a business decision, that's an individual decision. Um, every husband and wife needs one. Um, every, uh, actually a business person is actually a higher level of a state plan. But these can go all the way down to a single individual that has no descendants, no spouse. Well then, according to the law, this is what's going to happen. According to the law, if a single person dies, it goes to his parents. If there's if there's no one, un, if there's no children below, them, it goes to the parents. Um, if you don't want that to happen, if you want it to go somewhere else, then you have to spell that out in your estate plan. You have to say that I you don't want to go there. You want to go to this other person. Um, that was a huge issue uh, before before a gay marriage became legal. It was a it was a real problem because people's partners were being excluded from. From, uh, from inheritance. So that was a major issue that was a legal issue that we had to, have to address, but that's been mostly remedied um, now that our gay marriage has been legalized. Hope that answered your question. It's an individual thing. Everybody needs it to some extent. <laughs> so if you have nothing, you need to look at it and see what you need. I Peter. just add something you said. I'm not an attorney, but an associate of mine was the one who took this to the Supreme Court. You mentioned software. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how much you pay for that software. Unless you wrote it yourself, you do not own it. It's not an asset. That's why Mr. Gates is so rich. All you have is a license to use it. Yeah. So that going back to your, you know, the fact that it's on the computer or whatever, it's not an asset of the business. You don't actually own it. Yeah. You have a license to use it. That's all. And and it'll be facts specific unless you have a contract that says otherwise. Um, you go to the Supreme Court. That's usually because there was no contract that specifically said who owns it. That's what you should. If you contract that what I do belongs to you, then that's what it is. If it goes to the Supreme Court, it's probably because you didn't have that. And so now they got their head there with a fight over it. If you contract to it, there probably won't be a fight over it because you've already decided ahead of time. All right? Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. My name is Dave Sandler.